Ja, mina vänner. I'm going to change to English right away. Uh, so I have to give you a short background why we are taking up this topic. It was actually the Ministry of uh, Trade and Industry in Norway. They wanted to know what has actually been happening in the Barents region during the last 20 years and uh, with specific focus on the last 10 years. And um, the appointment was given to Aquaplan Niva, a Norwegian company, and they contacted us at Barents Center. So last spring in April, we conducted uh, the study it took actually three months, and uh, they actually told me from Aquaplan Niva that I have to make this presentation here. The document is 108 pages, and Aquaplan Niva was kind enough to send me a presentation which was only 39 PowerPoint pages. Today, you are going to see a presentation which is 10 pages, so it's a very finished approach. We try to keep it simple. So, um, this will tell about the co economic cooperation in Barents region and the period we are looking at, it's 2003-2013. And the geographical area, I think everyone knows when we are talking about Barents area, which areas and which counties we are talking about. Uh, for some of the people, we have made this very clear definition that Leningrad Oblast and St. Petersburg, they are not included because they are not part of Barents. We have checked through the whole private sector, legal entities, registered and active. And this means that we are talking about companies which are officially operating. So we are not talking about companies which just travel to conduct some work abroad. We have went through the public sector. We are looking at the European Union programs like Karelia NP, Colarctic NP, Euregio Karelia. And of course, how much the ministries of foreign affairs in Norway Sweden and Finland have been participating. And then, of course, public-private partnership uh, issues in those areas. Then we have the conclusions and recommendations. And to put it very simple, in private sector, in Republic of Karelia, we have 12 Finnish enterprises, three Swedish, no Norwegian companies. In Komi Republic, two Finnish companies, four Swedish. In Nenets, no Finnish companies at all, and one Swedish. In Arhangelsk, there are three Finnish companies registered and two Swedish. In Murmansk Oblast, uh, the number of Finnish companies is nine. And now the uh, Norwegians are making a splash. There are 37 Norwegian companies in Murmansk Oblast and one Swedish, which according to our information has gone bankrupt. So in total, uh, the number of officially registered and operative Finnish companies uh, in northwest of Russia is 26. And these 26 companies, they employ 1,300 per persons. Swedish. 11, they employ 1,200 persons, and these mentioned 37 Norwegian companies in Murmansk are employing approximately 1,000 persons. And to give you a comparison, in St. Petersburg, we have actually more than 400 Finnish companies and employing 40,000 people. So when we look at the flow the other way, how many Russian companies we are having in the Barents area in northern Sweden, in northern Finland, and in northern Norway. In northern Ostrobotnia in Finland, we have six Russian-owned businesses, and they are basically one-man businesses employing from one to two persons each. East Lapland, nine Russian-owned businesses, small one-man family enterprises in Lapland, 10 Russian-owned businesses, 
and they are also one man or family enterprises, mostly in tourism. So it's like cottage rentals and similar items. In Finnmark, we have 12 Russian owned businesses. In Troms, one Russian owned business. In Nordland, one Russian owned business. And in Westerbotten, one Russian owned business. And in Norrbotten, none. And uh, to give you a, how could we say, very simple background, we know the figures, we know the companies by name, but for some understandable reasons we are putting up the names here, but we know all these companies by name. And in public sector, then we come to a bit more interesting items. Uh, these are European Union uh, programs, and they usually have a runtime of two to three years. And they are actually operating with pretty large budgets, as you can, say, uh, as you can see. And the program usually consists of six, six, uh, 60 sub-projects, which are divided uh, to six main themes, tourism, forestry, energy, well-being, culture, and regional development. And these programs, they actually employ people in, how could we say, regional structures. On the Finnish side, the number of people employed by these programs, which are supported by European Union, Russia, and the participating Nordic countries, it's 304 uh, to seven, up to 400 on the Russian side. And the objective of these uh, programs is to strengthen the cross-border cooperation and provide mutual benefit, emphasis on Russia. So let's see what we have got as, uh, well, uh, I was actually going ahead uh, too quickly. So the money controlled uh, by Northern Finland was allocated to Karelia, and uh, the Finnish foreign ministry funding was cut five to five to six million euros uh, from earlier, 20 million euros per year. And the Finnish foreign ministry was cut to zero euros in 2013. So the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Finland supported the Barents area with roughly 36 million. The public sector funding through Finland 2003-2014 can be estimated to 300 million euros. And uh, the NP money which has been used, it consists of Russian, European Union, Finnish, Norwegian and Swedish funding. And the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs in Norway, actually, and here be very accurate with this, this figure is wrong. There is a comma mistake. We checked it yesterday and unfortunately we didn't have the time to change the presentation. So Norway spends approximately 20 to 24 million euros per year into Barents cooperation. And it means that in total, Norway has spent approximately 200 million euros on these operations. Well, the public-private partnership, there has not been happening very much actually. The only projects which have been successful are uh, in, within the uh, Northern Dimension Environmental Partnership and NEFCO projects. And they concentrate on wastewater treatment, uh, waterworks, energy saving, and waste management. And the funding is in total 177 million euros, but it's just financing. Russia is financing 44 million euros of that and the rest is divided between uh, the Nordic countries. And the money has been allocated to Arhangelsk, to Murmansk, to Petrosavorsk, and uh, then uh, to Komi and Vologda, and they are mostly waste for the treatment plants. So the conclusions are, more than 500 million euros have been spent in all those programs combined from Norway and Finland and Sweden. And unfortunately, these programs 
have had no effect whatsoever in business sense. So the companies which have come here, especially the Finnish companies, they have come here without any support from the programs. They have done it on pure business rational. The Norwegian companies have been a bit more fortunate. They have had the support mechanisms and they are using actively the support mechanisms in order to establish themselves in Murmansk. And the Swedes, they have been very, very passive. And when they have the business, they have been doing it by business rational. The Russians have now since 2010 taken a more active role and they want to see something substantial happening with their money because they are providing 25% of the funding. And especially uh, the road connections, transports and logistics are the items where the Russians we want to see results. And um, I think that is exactly the right way to go. And as you can see, so as uh, mentioned earlier, we have 26 Finnish companies, the Swedish number is 12, Norway 37, and that is not much, unfortunately. Anyhow, the NEFCO and the EP and EB are the funded projects which are providing infrastructure rebuilding with wastewater, uh, wastewater treatment plants, energy efficiency, district heating. These are very good projects. They are financially sound and the payments and the projects, they have been running exactly to the schedule and the loss rate in total has been less than 1% in these financing projects. So, what does Norway do with Russia? Or what Russia does with Norway? It's retail services, fish, power supply and equipment. Value of Russian turnover in Kirkenes is from 33 to 35 million euros. Export to Murmansk is 66 million euros, of which 23 million euros is for fish, and the rest is boats, cement, maritime equipment. Import from Murmansk is approximately 98 million euros. In total export to Nor from North Norway to Russia is 470 million euros, and you see the rest of the figures there. There is one item which I'd like to highlight when we are looking at uh, the tourism item, there was an article where Rune Raffelsen was making a comment concerning the uh, border crossing. And as you can see, 350,000 Russian tourists spend 600 to 700 million euros in Lapland every year. So each Russian coming to Finland is spending in average 200 euros each. And that's a lot of money. And the uh, tax-free sales to Russians are approximately 15 million euros. The Finns are importing uh, timber from uh, Karelia. Export to Murmansk is 182 million euros and import is 28 million euros. Karelia is much less and Arhangelsk is basically an export market for the Finns. And the Swedes, they have no common border, no significant tourism and the uh, trade with mechanical equipment, paper, timber, crude oil, and nickel. So they have some small operations there, but it's very low in value. So the recommendations are to focus on sectors with potential like fishery, aquaculture, including processing, tourism, timber, supplier industry for oil and gas, mining, construction, retail trade, and last but not least, infrastructure improvement, like clean water, wastewater treatment, waste management, energy saving, and an energy efficiency. Everyone knows that we have problems on the Russian side. And those problems which should be uh, solved to prior to real investments are is transparent legislation and predictable, uh, predictable interpretation of the same. Safety of investment through internationally bankable collateral and guarantees is a precondition for investments. 
So we don't have a development collateral or guarantee system yet in Russia. Sweden, uh, Sweden is pulling out of telecom and banking. Finland is decreasing wood and timber activities in Murmansk and Karelia, and Norway has suffered a bit in aquaculture involvement in Russian barrens. So it's time to take a breath. We have to create a dialogue with the Russian federal, regional and municipal authorities together with them, uh, together with our own national authority services like consulates, embassies and relevant ministries in order to create report and long-term two-way communication. Because for the time being, it's very, very hard for the Western operators to be active in a sensible way in Russia. The reason and the background why I'm saying is that I have a Russian company since 20 years, <laughs> and it's still operational, but in St. Petersburg. We should have this one window system in Russia, which the Russians are promoting, but we have not seen any results of it yet. I hope that Murmansk finally comes how could you say, in check with this, because there is a clear intention in Murmansk to create a one-window system for Western investors, but we haven't seen any results of it yet. And the Russian side is pushing for the NP and any program money to improve uh, the road connections, and my suggestion is that the European Union money should actually be allowed to be used for transports and logistics, instead of having, how could you say, so much people to people and culture, cultural activities, which I do appreciate personally, because it's very nice to go and, how could you say, practice cultural issues on the Russian side, but we should actually concentrate a bit more on substance. And we have a big problem. The traveling in this area, wherever you go, it takes 6 to 12 hours to get there and 6 to 12 hours to get back. So we have to look at the possibilities to improve the traffic uh, conditions, flight connections, and uh, get a real connection east-west up here. So these are the guilty persons. Rune Rautio, he's senior advisor at Aquaplan Niva, Alexei Bambuliak, and me, myself. And I think we are pretty exact on time. This is the Finnish way of doing things. <laughs> so, <laughs> now I have to tell you one thing. I wanted to start with a good story, a good joke. But unfortunately, this is such a serious issue, so I have to do it in, yeah, in the end. Our foreign ministry and the minister of foreign trade, Alexander Stubb, he's actually a Finn Swede, and he describes Finns correctly as very, very shy persons. They don't make a big noise about themselves. So the question is, and I'm giving the question to all of you, how What's the difference between an introvert and extrovert Finn? Okay. An introvert Finn, when he talks, he looks at his feet. The extrovert Finn look at his partner's feet. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. <laughs>